Okay, friends, let's move forward now. This is still Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 80, but we're in uh, section C. And I was going to go right into Libra, but I realized I'd left out a paragraph here. So let us conclude our work in Scorpio. <clears throat> the key words of this sign are significant and illuminating. So it is, um, let Maya flourish and deception rule. That's one of them, right? <clears throat> and the other is, warrior am I, and from the battle I emerge triumphant. It's obvious which is which. So we have, as he says here, deception and triumph. Deception. It's almost as if there is a, um, a kind of a <clears throat> plot to veil the truth in the swirl of Maya, glamour, and illusion. It's as if this uh, creative imagination, which was discussed earlier in terms of uh, aligning with the intuition, is used in order to um, conceal the spiritual truth, because the imagination is under the spell of instinct and egoistic desire. So, obviously, there's a triumph over the three-headed dog, a triumph over the three major uh, mental, emotional, and physical heads of the hydra, each of those sections being threefold. There's a triumph over the number three, the delusive aspect of the number three that almost deliberately misleads. The hosts of Mara, which the Buddha fought, are found in Scorpio. And it is a creation of a false reality, and one that uh, deceives the human being for millions upon millions of years until the factor of extrication at last takes hold through the will to see, the will to penetrate, through the light of day, which eventually dawns for the scorpionic individual, that consciousness rises into the cosmic ethers, onto the buddhic plane and beyond and sees the full light of the spiritual sun eventually, and is no longer confined in those forms which stir a type of false desire for an unreal world. So there is, uh, as he says here, control by Maya, or control by the soul, and here Maya is capitalized, I think it stands for all three delusive aspects, the usual Maya, then glamour and illusion, the great Maha Maya, which is the very opposite of the reality which the greatest light reveals, uh, the kind of reality that the greatest light is. Conflict and peace. Well, it is a fourth ray sign primarily, isn't it? It has so much Mars in it, and even Mercury is sometimes called the star of conflict. So the warring aspect of the fourth ray is dominant. But the peace can also be brought forward, just as the human um, family, the group of human monads in the fourth grade of hierarchy, will be eventually peacemakers, even though they are ruled by Scorpio. It's interesting the amount of force and courage and tenacity that may be required in order to 
uh, create the peace. The United Nations, United Nations Day, at least the ideal of what it is to be, um, is October 24th. It's in Scorpio, interestingly enough. So we must look at Scorpio as a sign of eventual triumph through peace. Let victory crown the efforts of the Blessed One by harmonizing all. It tells us in the old commentary on the fourth ray, Blessed One. Victory is the theme of Scorpio, but it's a victory through peace and harmony. And this perhaps should be emphasized. We still seem to be in the warlike uh, position with regard to this sign which has so often been associated with war. I think, though, that in order for the peace to prevail, some very strong measures often have to be taken. And we sometimes look to uh, great warriors as those who have eventually created the peace. So deception and triumph, control by Maya and control by the soul, conflict and peace, these are the hidden secrets. These are the hidden secrets of this sign, and they are summed up for all disciples in the two key words or key phrases, really. Upon the ordinary wheel whereon the soul is found, the, the soul in incarnation is found blind, blinded by the threefold deception and apparently helpless, not powerful, not courageous, not triumphant. The word goes forth in the following terms. The word is a, <clears throat> a statement from a spiritual source which declares the kind of experience through which this immersed soul must pass before attaining liberation. And the word said, let Maya flourish and let deception rule a great vitalization of the forces of deception. I'm reminded of the three types of members of the Black Lodge. They are the destroyers of souls on the first ray, the deceivers of souls on the second. How interesting. This being associated with the the fourth and sixth ray found in Scorpio, and finally the manipulators of souls found on the third ray. There is no chance but to be confined to the underworld, which Pluto rules. And this world is the dense physical vehicle of the planetary logos with all of the mayas, glamours, and illusions found thereon. The soul is entirely bewildered and does not know its true origin. And without knowing its true origin, how can it be ever triumphant? Upon the reversed wheel, the soul chants or sings the words. And we should not um, ignore these words chants or sings. It's an especially triumphant uh, form of expression, which interestingly is on the axis with Taurus, which is a primary ruler of the great wave of sound. So the triumphant soul, in the kind of a victory paean, chants or sings the triumphant words, warrior I am, and from the battle I emerge triumphant. There are 
a number of triumphs here. One can triumph over each one of the vehicles. And there are lesser triumphs, preparing for the final triumph, which sees the immersed soul, really an extension of the monad, emerging onto the buddhic plane after the destruction of the causal body. That buddhic plane being ruled by Scorpio, at least the human creative hierarchy which has its focus there is ruled by Scorpio. So it must be a sign of harmony as well as of conflict since it is so closely associated with the buddhic plane. A simple statement of words is not as strong as that which is chanted or sung because it accords with the great musical basis of our created worlds. And the chant is magical in its effect and is sustained by the great current of sound. I guess my eyes have fallen now on this sentence maybe for the first time so consciously. The soul, who really is the one who is liberated, chants or sings. It's a very powerful affirmation. And it is all along the soul that has been the warrior. The disciple really is the soul. And now uh, emerges out of identification with and out from under the domination of the threefold personality and even emerges finally uh, out of the dense physical vehicle of the Soto Logos whereon the causal body is found. Warrior I am, and from the battle I emerge triumphant. Okay, friends. Um, what I see here, you know, I, I, I thought I had finished Scorpio. Well, you never finish with these signs. DK has given us something of great value. But he would be the first to say that he's given us uh, material in outline form and that many of the details have to be filled in by students <clears throat> such as we are. So continuing um, with Libra. Uh, in 80, in EAA 80C, <clears throat> page 226. Well, now we uh moving clockwise through the signs, as is DK's method to impress upon us this mode of energy travel. He's written his whole book in a most impressive manner, seemingly backwards, but making his point about the necessity of reversing the wheel at a certain point in the developmental history of the human being, with Scorpio much involved through its exalted planet Uranus, and Libra involved as well, and Aries, also ruled by Uranus hierarchically, giving the impulse it is this Martian-Uranian urge which wants to break out of the usual rotary conditioning uh, in which the immersed soul has been entrapped. And so comes the day, comes the time when it is no longer sufferable to remain in a limited condition of consciousness one intuits that there is a higher possibility looming ahead. And one drastically and dramatically throws oneself against the prevailing currents, creating a great friction and rending process. One swims against the stream as the salmon does on its way to its source. 
I wonder what the analogy for the waiting bears may be, you know, as the salmon attempt to leap uh, against the waterfalls that they once negotiated with ease when they were small. The bears are waiting for them as they <clears throat> try to jump over the waterfalls. What an amazing metaphor here. What a story. I guess it's a dangerous trip. The form does not so easily survive it, and those who do have certainly proved their power. Maybe they have a chance to try again and again until they are among the successful ones, escaping the many snares that await them. Well, anyway, we are going to move into Libra, also pronounced Libra, also pronounced Libra. I remember um, Lib and Liberation. I remember the well-known astrologer Mark Edmund Jones calling it Libra and also Pisces instead of Pisces. Uh, he was not a man to make mistakes. The pronunciations were probably quite legitimate, but I'll stick with the ones that we have been using. And DK begins here on page 226. He says, the sign Libra is one of peculiar interest, but in a most paradoxical manner. For much of its interest is based upon the fact that it lacks spectacular interest of any kind, except in the case of disciples or those nearing the path, because, you know, it is, after all, uh, uh, one of the signs of crisis, along with uh, Leo and I think Capricorn. So very eventful decisions have to be made in this sign, but it is a sign which uh, attempts at least to avoid extremes, though quite a number of Libra people seem to be involved in various kinds of extremes. As one of my colleagues said, well, the, uh, the tail of the scorpion is pointing towards it, and so is the spear of the centaur. How peaceful can it be? Yet it is um, often a sign of moderation, which attempts to blend and harmonize and not be too noteworthy for a position which is taken. So there is a kind of a, uh, a quality of modesty, of moderation, of in-betweenness, of um, before a certain point, of non-commitment. Of course, once the scales do fall, once the pans of the scales do fall, there is a commitment, and it is, after all, a sign of decision, and it's not entirely of a harmonizing nature under the influence of Venus. It is also strongly under the influence of Uranus, and even more so under the influence of Saturn, which is definitely a determining and decisive planet. So when judgment finally comes in, and Libra is the judge, it is determining. Uh, says the Tibetan here, it is a sign of balancing, of careful weighing of values. I remember some associating this sign with the fourth ray, although it does not specifically as given come through Libra. But as I say, there are a number of rays constellationally associated with each of the signs, so perhaps on one of its levels the fourth ray is to be found. Um, I remember Mary Bailey speaking of the judicial mind. She related it to um, the fourth ray when it was functioning in a proper manner. And we certainly think of the judicial attitude, the legislative attitude, 
the cautious attempt to arrive at the right decision. We associate all these things with Libra. So both Libra and the fourth ray in the minds of some have similar qualities, especially the harmonizing aspects of the fourth ray, not those which promote conflict. Though Libra is involved in many wars, once aggression has been committed, the equal and opposite reaction is often in the hands of Libra, the striking back to recreate the disturbed balance. So it is a sign of balancing, of careful weighing of values. Therefore, uh, what should we say, um, uh, this is not entirely so, but with the tendency to avoid bias and to be fair-minded and of achieving the right equilibrium between the pairs of opposites. In this case, the pairs of opposites, the most notable of them in our work, uh, is that pair, the soul and the personality. But there are other opposites as well. Spirit and matter, of course, are opposites. And there are horizontal opposites as well, more or less on the same level. The vertical pairs of opposites and the horizontal pairs of opposites. Achieving the right equilibrium between the pairs of opposites. And we know that it is possible for some people to go to extremes denying the personality in the vehicles or denying the soul and its higher potentials, either one of them, of those attitudes, will lead to difficulty and imbalance. So there come certain lives when these pairs of opposites have to be justly <clears throat> balanced against each other, uh, a fair sharing of emphasis. This does not last forever because the universe is hierarchical in its nature. At least occultism assert, asserts this. And always the higher of a pair of opposites must prevail. It might be regarded, this sign might be regarded as the sign in which the first real vision of the path appears kind of wonder whether the purifications undertaken in Virgo, uh, the clarification of vision, the de-glamorization, at least of some of the worst glamours, the improvement of the physical etheric condition, all the things which Virgo does, so clarifies consciousness that um, the first vision of the path the first real vision of the path, or the first vision of the real path, appears. Uh, interesting that Venus, a planet so much uh, connected with the idea of the beam of light, is the ruler here. And the path is the one that can be trodden between the pairs of opposites and trodden with greater safety than when one overemphasizes, let us say, the spirit aspect and does not consider the integrity of the form, which will only have to be rebuilt if unwisely destroyed. So it might be regarded as the sign in which the first real vision of the path appears and of the goal towards which the disciple must ultimately direct his steps. Now that goal is um, at first the soul and then the monad and uh, Shambhala. And I'm thinking about this path which is in a way symbolized by the spinal column and by the central channel of the etheric uh, spine, the Shushumna, and how it does lead from the base to the crown and back again. 
probably involution takes us from the crown to the base and evolution from the base to the crown. But it is uh, a direct and unobstructed channel for the evolving son of man um, towards a higher purpose which the head and the head center represent. And uh, interestingly, Libra is intimately associated with Shambhala as the center of perfect peace and presumably balance where archetypal intention prevails in the world of being. I'm remembering from the Sabian Symbols book, um, commented on by Dane Rudyard and uh, Mark Edmund Jones, that the very first degree of Libra has to do with perfect archetypes, which are seen as butterflies uh, in a collection. They are stable, they are static. They are the forms to which all of the forms must uh, eventually conform. So the uh, after much battle in the realm of lower ego and much need for humility and a clarification of consciousness, uh, divesting it of its own self-importance, divesting the lower ego of its self-importance, perhaps then it is that the path can be seen. I think uh, Libra and Leo are very related. DK will tell us that the reversal of the wheel is going to occur under the Leo and Libra influence. So it's in the fifth or Leonian petal that the path of aspiration becomes um, a reality and where the grossest forms of egoism are lived beyond and it is there in relation to that pedal and perhaps in relation to the seventh pedal which in terms of sequence we can consider ruled by Libra that the man can become the true aspirant and eventually the first degree initiate. Once that fifth petal is completely unfolded. So perhaps while the fifth petal is unfolding, stirrings and developments in the Libran petal, the seventh, offer up a vision which makes it possible to pursue the higher potentials of the fifth petal and eventually become a first degree initiate. It might be regarded as the sign in which the first real vision of the path appears. Of course, the whole idea of walking the straight and narrow and not veering off uh, along the various byways which can mislead and can take one back into the realm of Maya glamour illusion. Uh, the symbolism is there as we think of the Libran path and in the human body and the human etheric nature and even with the Antikarana, that path is a straight path, although it may have some figure eight energy flows associated with it, but essentially straight. And uh, the first real vision of the goal towards which the disciple must ultimately direct his steps. I suppose as the spiritual will comes in, uh, sort of uh, enforced and imposed by Vulcan, but basically emanating from the Libran plane of Atma, a vision of ultimate destinations is likely to appear, because the will will take us there. The will has this homing instinct, and our center of being is most closely related to the will aspect. This path is the narrow, razor-edged path. It's so easy to lose our balance upon this path. It seems to imply a degree of vigilance and possibly discomfort in those who tread that path because they must ever ever be 
watchful as they put one foot in front of another. It's not a broad path. It's not the primrose path. It is narrow. This path is the narrow razor-edged path which runs between the pairs of opposites. There is a proper uh, balance step for each human being to take as he puts one foot in front of another on his spiritual quest. And this path will respect the spirit soul, the soul spirit, without disrespecting the form. It's so easy to make the mistake of Hercules in Virgo and disrespect or even kill the form which is meant to serve the higher intentions. In Libra, this is corrected. Every sign, in a way, holds the corrective to the mistake that was made in the previous sign. So this path is the narrow razor-edged path which runs between the pairs of opposites. There is a just way, a correct way to take that next step. And Saturn, as such a strong ruler of Libra, uh, tells us that there will be a degree of caution in the more advanced Libra about how that step is taken. And sometimes this looks like indecision. Also, the third ray, which the Tibetan tells us is a ray of watchfulness and planning and caution, is at this time, it appears, the preeminent ray constellationally passing through Libra and also through two of its rulers, Saturn and Uranus. Yes, Uranus does have some third ray passing through it. This narrow path which, if it is to be safely trodden, requires the development of the sense of values, and there's Venus as the ruler of Libra, the development of the sense of values, weighing up these values, and the power to utilize rightly the balancing analytical faculty of the mind so that errors are avoided, or should we say Let's put it this way, so that missteps upon the path are avoided. Missteps. If we are cautious and we decide where that foot must go, the amount of energy that must be put into that next step, how big a step it will be, how small a step it will be, whether it uh, respects all factors that have to be sustained in relationship to each other, we can do all those things, we can rightly, rightly tread the path. It is also a sign of intuitive perception. Interesting this. Um, the Jupiterian signs are said to be intuitive signs. Sagittarius among them, certainly Pisces we recognize as intuitive. The advanced Aquarian, ruled esoterically by Jupiter, is intuitive. But here we're, we're um, speaking of intuitive perception in Libra, even though it's ruled by the third ray and has as its planetary expression fifth ray Venus, seventh ray Uranus, third ray Saturn, hardline rays. But perhaps it's because what we can say is that uh, intuition enters at the interlude. And Libra is the sign of the interlude, the pause for reception or impression. It rules in a way a kind of higher interlude where the consciousness is held up for possible impression from a higher source. So, you know, it's very important to for us to see how Master DK sees these signs. They may not be the conventional explanations that we are used to, but he has good reason for saying what he says. 
So when a person begins to tread the path, he is guided by what? The voice of the soul, the still small voice, the inner counsel. Well, this is the beginning, perhaps, of intuitive perception, being open to guidance from that which is not entirely obvious, but which comes from the higher of a pair of opposites, of a pair of opposites. Interesting. Okay then, resuming. A sign of intuitive perception and on the ordinary way of progression, the clockwise way around the zodiac, it comes normally after the drastic experience of the man in Scorpio. Seems to be a bit of an interlude of peace, relative peace, after the loss and the trials and the tests of the Scorpio experience. And this is usually of such a nature that the instinct to self-preservation has been aroused to such an extent that in the dire need of the man, not the disciple at this time, a call to the soul has gone forth and has evoked response. So, um, calling upon the soul in Scorpio as an act of self-preservation. This may be put forth to come forth as God help me. You know, the prayers of those who are threatened, when surrounded on all sides by the powers of negativity or darkness, um, as Moria says, the disciple is meant to look up, because that is the only way he can look for sustainment. So, some sort of um, soul response is coming in for the Scorpio individual, due to the dire necessity, the dire need. And this, the response from the soul, may be recognized as intuition. The first few faint flashes of the intuition have been sensed and vaguely recognized because the soul will respond. And even though the man does not really understand, it is the man, not the disciple here, TK tells us, even though the man will not respond, uh, will not understand the source, they have come forth and they are registered. So this is interesting. He's speaking of the way the ordinary man has drastic experiences in Scorpio, even though he's not being tested spiritually per se. These are experiences of forced renunciation. You can imagine if you are working on the third petal of the egoic lotus, which is the petal of enforced sacrifice, and you have Scorpio powerful in your chart, you can imagine what you might be put through. Or let us say Pisces are there. Then follows the experience in Libra, we're in, I suppose, relatively, a life is spent in quiet, thoughtful reflection. I'm sometimes interested to see how Libra plays its part in the lives of mathematicians. Some of the most famous have Sun and Libra, Libra rising. I'm reminded of this by the idea of quiet and thoughtful reflection. Of course, they represent a, a high stage of development. So quiet, thoughtful reflection, or in a condition of static unresponsiveness. It may seem that not much is accomplished and not much movement can be made. Different alternatives are given, and of course with Libra, always alternatives are given. 
It may be a life of balancing, of weighing this and that, and of determining which way the scales shall fall, so that in the next sign, certain designed results will occur. It seems that there is a possibility of reorientation here. The idea of preparation, an interlude, a preparation for another life in another sign. Now, I suppose uh, the next life may follow in sequence the signs suggested, or it may not. I mean, so many people die in signs that are not sequentially related, either clockwise or counterclockwise, to the sign in which they were born. But now we're talking about the reversed, uh, the clockwise wheel, the backwards wheel, as it were. And, and DK is assuming that the life will continue to move, as it were, clockwise, i.e. backwards. The following Virgo life will be either one of a personality, materialistic nature, presuming that the values weighed up were material, uh, whoopsie, presuming, let's see, let me come down here again. Yeah, here we are again. Presuming that in the Libran weighing, um, material values um, dominated. And if that is the case, and not spiritual values, if that is the case, that spiritual values did not, as it were, win, then the next life, which is according to the formula at least, following in Virgo as the sign uh, on the clockwise side of Libra, that that life will be one of a personality, materialistic nature, lived under the influence of the materialistic, material aspect of Virgo, i.e., let matter reign, which is the... Uh, let's say, the human mantrum of Virgo, demanding uh, a reorientation through evolution, or the human mantrum which can only be corrected through long years of gradual evolution. So it will be lived under the material aspect of Virgo, the mother. That's one possibility. Either stasis or a material decision which leads to material personal life. It would be interesting to confront various Virgos and see where they came from. Or there will be evidence to slowly emerging soul vibration, the result of that intuitive revelation of the soul in Libra. Or there will result, or be evidenced, a slowly emerging soul vibration, indicating that hidden spiritual life of which the Virgin Mother is the foreordained custodian. So, uh, spiritual values are planted in uh, Virgo, um, having emerged in Libra. Uh, well, having emerged in Scorpio, um, and then uh, subjected to weighing in Libra. Under necessity, calling for help, calling for some aid to survive in one way or another, the soul has been evoked. That evocation goes into the Libra life, and the values are weighed up, if the decision is made in favor of those emerging spiritual values, then there will be the gradual germination of the seed of spirituality 
in the Virgo life. As progress is made, recurrently or cyclically around the wheel of life, um, these experiences and vibratory activities intensify in character until the time comes when the reversal of the wheel takes place. By this time, presumably we are moving or ready to move in a counterclockwise manner. It's interesting, uh, it seems that similar experiences are building up in the same sign as the ongoing cycle reactivates that sign time after time. So a certain amount of accomplishment has been achieved in a particular sign. Perhaps that type of accomplishment in specificity is left behind. But when the focus is again uh, in that type, in that sign, then a new and greater uh, building up of the achievement occurs. So, you know, it would be interesting to compare what was it like for us the last time the sign or signs that are most emphasized in our chart this time were emphasized before. What was it like when they were emphasized before? What type, let's say if I was born in Aries, which I am, what is what type of Aresian person was I when last in Aries? Probably don't want to look. <laughs> or, you know, if my rising sign is Cancer, which it is, then the last time that occurred, to what level of building uh, did the process bring me? And was there a continuation and an elevation from that point? All of this is part of accurate reincarnational research, uh, taking in the consideration of astrology and rheology and the gradual unfoldment of the egoic lotus. It will be a real spiritual psychology, and we will be in a position to advise ourselves and to advise others about the next best step to be taken on the path. So the wheel is going to be reversed here now from clockwise to counterclockwise and then Libra leads on to Scorpio. Well, does it do so immediately? That This is the question. Is it all so very sequential as the Tibetan seems to imply or are there other ways we can consider the phrase that Libra leads on to Scorpio? But let's just assume for the moment that this paradigm of sequence is an accurate one, then Libra leads on to Scorpio in the active soul life, active through the medium of the personality and nature, and not simply on its own plane. Well, it's probably always active on its own plane, but then the active soul life is registered, hmm, recorded and noted in Virgo, and balanced and assessed in Libra, eventually bringing about the tests and trials in Scorpio. So we've um, gotten as far back as uh, Virgo, and then a kind of reversing of the wheel is going to occur. This spiritual life, of which the Virgin Mother is the foreordained custodian, is growing. And then... Libra will lead on to Scorpio and the active soul life. Mm -hmm. And to the act and the active soul life, actors of the medium of the personality and nature is registered, recorded and noted in Virgo. I think Virgo takes very good notes. So there's a clarity in Virgo about what the soul is saying. Clarity about the message. Um, conveyed by the soul. After all, it is a Mercurian sign, and Mercury is the one with the pen in his hand, the communicator. Then, uh, the overall value of each way of proceeding is again balanced and assessed in Libra. 
that which is registered, recorded, and noted in Virgo, which is um, the soul life, the testimony of the soul life, is weighed to determine its value relative to the more familiar material values. What really is worth the effort? This is determined in another Libran life, or a life dominated by this sign. Eventually, uh, assuming then that the decision is for the spiritual values in a decisive way, eventually bringing about the tests and trials between the soul and personality. This is going to occur in Scorpio, which latter, i.e. the personality, fights with power and determination. Look at those Scorpionic words. Power and determination to preserve the status quo of the balanced expression of these two, where the preponderance of personality influence is not possible. Perhaps this even happens in perhaps this even happens in Libra itself. But the tests and trials particularly are known to occur in Scorpio and the Martian personality is much empowered uh, even though the disciple has made the decision that spiritual values are of the utmost importance there is an aspect of his nature which is not touched by that decision and which is operating according to its ancient habits and will fight against the new determination, will fight with power and determination against the new decision which has been made in Libra. The preserving of the status quo is pretty much the function of Libra, but then a decision will at length be made. Now just think about those lives in which, let us say, the sun is in Libra and Scorpio is the ascendant. You can get the picture. A decision is made and then the battle is on. Because there will be an aspect of the nature which wants to preserve the status quo. The person will be empowered by Scorpio, both in his disciplic nature and in his personal nature. And there will be a real contention with the will of the disciple, focused on bringing soul values into predominance. But the empowered personality will fight against this. And this is all preparatory to a true reversal, uh, achieving of triumph and freedom, so that there is not just a, a battlefield where no real progress is shown by one or by the other. Uranus is involved in both of these signs, and Uranus is the planet of reversal leading to a new and better way. One, and, and the militancy of the battle is indicated by Mars. But Mars is in detriment in Libra, so we're not likely to get such a battle there. It's only after the, the Saturnian decision is made and we enter into the Scorpio influence that the real battle will occur. Of course, in, in an astrological chart, you can be a, let's say you're born as a Libra. Uh, let's say maybe you are born with uh, Virgo rising. Maybe the midpoint of Virgo. After 45 years, your progressed ascendant, 45 years or so, your progressed ascendant will reach Scorpio. That too is a way of bringing in the battlefield once a decision has been made in Libra, if it has been made. There are many astrological setups which can follow what the Tibetan is speaking of here. The nurturing of the soul's message in Virgo, the weighing up of the value of the recorded message of the soul, and then the struggle to establish that soul um, impression as reality 
against the ancient prerogatives of the personality. Maybe some of us who are listening to this are passing through it at the moment. Libra can also be spoken of in terms of the meditation process as taught in both East and West. It can therefore be regarded as the interlude between two activities, <coughs> which is the explanation given to that stage of meditation we call contemplation. Now here he gives this famous listing of the ways in which the stages of meditation are associated with certain signs of the zodiac. In the five stages of meditation as usually taught, you have the following, concentration, meditation, contemplation, illumination, and inspiration. These five stages are paralleled in the five strictly human signs of the zodiac. This is interesting. It doesn't mean that the glyph of these signs is a human character. Only Gemini and the water carrier, which are not mentioned here, have specifically human characters. So uh, still they take us from the instinctual side of man to the divine side. They take us all the way from the uh, emergent uh, egoic uh, personality consciousness, the lower ego of Leo, the lower type of identification, uh, through a purification process, through a weighing up of values, through a struggle to establish those values, and to a uh, aspirational orientation which leads beyond the, the uh, human state. Well, let's just say it leads into the world of the divine where the human being is established as a member of the fifth kingdom of nature and in a way Capricorn which is not a sign mentioned here but toward which Sagittarius leads uh, gives us full entree into the fifth kingdom of nature where we are no longer strictly speaking a human being. We are individualized in a way in Leo and become a human being in Leo with the help of certain other signs like Gemini and so forth. Uh, but we are still very subject to mass consciousness, to instinctual non-individualized consciousness in, ca in Cancer. So Cancer shows us the human being who is not really awakened to his own uh, distinct humanity. And Sagittarius shows us the human being who is about to launch into another kingdom altogether. All right, so this uh, takes us to Esoteric Astrology Adventure, EAA 80, uh, C, and page, what page? 228. And we will begin with um, EAA ADD, page 228.